I I had this one song stuck in my head this entire episode. Okay. What song did you have stuck in your head this entire episode? <laughs> oh, if yes, I only had, had a brain. brain. <laughs> Perhaps I could use this as an excuse to go to those far off planets with little polka dotted people if necessary and be able to talk about love, war, nature, God, sex, all those things that go to make up the excitement of the human condition. I'm Captain James Kirk. Spock. You move, Captain. Jim Kirk of the Enterprise. What's going on? I'm James Kirk. These people are my friends and my shipmates. Leave my crew alone. Out of the question. How about that? James Kirk. It fits like a glove, Captain. All the bonehead ideas, gentlemen. I'm Captain James Kirk. <laughs> Get out of my chair. Get out of it now. My greetings and felicitations, Captain. So good of you and your officers to, uh, <laughs> drop in. Absolutely smashing. Joe on True, everyone, and welcome to Humanist Trek. It's a Star Trek podcast about the humanism in Star Trek. I'm Sarah Ray. And I'm Allie Ashmead. And then we can talk about, uh... Whatever the fuck we we're talking about. We oh, it's, just... it's uh, American Indian Heritage yeah. Month. I think that's what it was called in my Google calendar and how maybe we should not say American Indian. Right. And indigenous. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. Indigenous. But whatever it is, we need to use the right term. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, the Christopher Columbus was several weeks ago, and I just put up a picture with a, a middle finger. Fuck Christopher Columbus. Yeah, fuck that guy. Yeah, I, I can't believe we celebrated. We were, ugh, I just feel so dirty because at some point I did what my school told me to do, and we celebrated that. Happy Christopher Columbus Day. Yeah. And then we got our construction paper out and we did our little art projects with turkey feathers uh -huh. and oh, making yeah. the and I'm just like so embarrassed. Yeah, it's, me too. It's sad. You know, and I thought we would have grown over the years, but when our youngest was in kindergarten, mm -hmm. I believe, they did a, a re like little presentation thing, you know, like a not when I was in school, we had like full on fucking productions every year. Mm -hmm. This was like a, um, uh, it was like an, an assembly, right? Where the kids came and each class did a song or two or whatever. Mm -hmm. And it was very much like the Indians and the pilgrims and oh, and shit like that. And oh, I was like, no. what the fuck is going on right now? And it was 2015, 2016. They should have been a lot more woke at this. Yeah, time. they should yeah. have. And so I'm sitting in this, in the cafeteria watching my child like, performing this thing. Fuck? Um, yeah. And I'm like, what are, and it was not, I mean, it, it was not like a, a public school in a bad neighborhood. You mm -hmm. know, it was a, it was a choice magnet arts school for fuck's sake. Yep. We had to get chosen like on a lottery system just <laughs> to get your kid in there. Oh, congratulations. <laughs> like I would have expected them to know better, but I guess not. No, no. Yeah. I mean, it's the, it's, it's infuriating. Yeah. And now he's 13. We moved states to a more progressive state, and he's doing like learning all about you know the uh, all of the American Indian history stuff, mm -hmm. and the assignments that are coming home still say like American Indian. Yeah, and I'm like, uh, no. Nah, I mean, I guess change it, that shit. I guess it it takes a while for that stuff to you know cycle through the school curriculum, but yeah, yeah we should especially. Be changing. Especially because we know that most textbooks are printed where? Texas. Texas. Yeah. Yep. yep. So there you go. So and we're we're getting a Texas level education yeah. in our textbooks. Yep. Yeah. Still. Fucking people running around without brains. I'll tell you what. <laughs> <laughs> nice. And one. that, my friends, brings us to Boom. this episode of Star Trek, the original series, season two, episode 27. Spock's brain. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> that was uh, good. Sir, contact with an object. It's moving toward us. No visual contact yet. Reflect towards full intensity. Pursue. Yes, Captain. Anything on your scanners? It's coming at light speed. Collision course. Visual contact. Anything over? All wavelengths dominated by ionization effects, sir. All engines full stop. So, right off the top of the episode here, I want to talk about the remastering. Did you look at any of these comparisons at all? Because there's some stuff here. So my biggest, so episode one, season three, mm -hmm. I noticed some stuff that wasn't necessarily about the remastering, but 
definitely about the actors themselves. Oh, okay. They all looked so good. Like William Shatner had slimmed down. Mm-hmm. Um, Jimmy Doohan had, had like really just... He looked... Yeah, his hair Chiseled. was different or something, and yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, either they had a new makeup person, right. or somebody told them, "Hey, you guys, you've hit the big time. You're real yeah. actors now." And you, they just like, "You need to get to the gym." Yeah. yeah. So I mean, everyone I, just yeah. looked so much better and good at this episode. So wow, yeah. But but you saw the- from yeah from the remastering. I feel like they took a lot more liberties here than i realized because the opening shot of this alien ship Mm -hmm. isn't just like an upscale digitized version of the original they redesigned this ship completely what so the original ship was like a kind of a rocket looking ship that had like fins that came out it was (laughs) like it was everything was shaped like a rocket back then yeah it was a very right yeah it was either a rocket or a a flying saucer (laughs) so it was a rocket shaped thing and the thing that they remastered it to is like this hockey puck looking thing. Yeah. That kind of like or whatever. Like I didn't know that. So so there's a part of me that's pissed about this. Mm-hmm. Right? Like, should I have been watching the original ver like the non remastered version? Should mm-hmm. I be watching? because I'm trying to get that like feel. legitimate feel of yeah, of how the things were. I didn't think about it. Yeah. Cause um if I went back and watched the unmastered, I wonder how much would be that different. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because again, and I didn't think they changed this much stuff. I thought they were just taking the original footage and remastering it yeah. to a better quality. But they're uh, actually changing, changing shit. Stuff. Yeah. That's like, what's it called? Like Apocrypha or something? You go in and what's it called when you change the holy word? <laughs> That's what they're doing. Oh, they're going religion? Back in and, just religion in general? Right? I mean, <laughs> it's called the... It's it's called a new religion. <laughs> That's what it's, I'm going to reinterpret it the way that I see it. So the other one we get a little bit later, I'll point it out. Um, we get a shot of the planet's surface, which was totally a new, mm-hmm. completely new image that was not shown in the original episode. Also. Okay. Interesting. So I wasn't sure if the Enterprise is in pursuit of this unidentified alien vessel or if they're just encountering it. Or what? I that got was, the sense they were just encountering it. Okay. Um, they were just drifting along it as they do. <laughs> <laughs> and then here comes this alien ship. But it starts out as they're immediately in red alert. The bridge is abuzz with activity. It's using ion propulsion, which has Scotty hard. And Uhura's got no reply to Hale's. Spock reads 100-ish life forms aboard uh, with nitrogen, oxygen, atmosphere. Suddenly, Spock's computer station goes nuts, and this week's Star Trek sex object beams herself onto the bridge. (laughs) (laughs) Cue the string music as, for a moment, they forget that she's an alien that's just beamed aboard their ship, and they're all pretty much struck by her beauty. So this woman's name is Kara. And she is played by Marge Doucet. Mm. Uh, you probably know her from 60 episodes of All My Children. Were you a big soaps person? I was, but All My Children, the uh, the ones on ABC, I hated. Oh. Like, uh, I didn't watch All My Children. Huh. I So my mother watched All My Children. And my s- junior and senior, the, the, was it junior and senior year? It was like two summers that I worked at our school over the summer with, mm-hmm. with the maintenance guys and the custodial people. <laughs> and they were all dudes, right? Mm-hmm. And for lunch every day, we would, would watch- go, we would go sit, <laughs> <laughs> we would go sit down in the bus uh, yep. shop, the maintenance sh- bus shop. That's awesome. And watch. Yeah. The story. That's what <laughs> my mama would say. Well, I got to watch my stories. Uh-huh. And I don't know why they called uh-huh. it soap operas. Oh, I've there's a reason this up before, but yeah, I I don't know. Um, I've heard it before. I I watched like all the like Ryan's Hope and Edge of Night. Do you remember Edge of Night? Oh, that was old. Uh That didn't last for. I mean, that was gone a long time ago. (laughs) Ryan's Hope and oh yeah, General Uh Hospital and Young and the Restless and Guide and Light and Santa Barbara. Well, so interestingly enough, this Marjorie Marge (laughs) Doucet was also in 124 episodes of Guiding Light. Really. Who was her name? Who's Alexandra Spaulding. Oh, my God. 
I know now. I now, now I know, know who she, it is. Yeah. Wow. The Spaldings. They were that. That was. Uh, oh my goodness. <laughs> it didn't look. I didn't even. I look at her and I didn't see it. Wow. Wow. Okay, so she was in Guiding Light, 1994 to 2009. Oh, now I see. Yeah. So later. Yep. Years. She. She. So she had her hair cut like a real short bob. Uh huh. And she was the rich bitch. <laughs> um, but yeah, I didn't know. I didn't recognize her. Wow. Yeah. 60. That was 30. 90s. Some, yeah. 30, 40 years difference. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> wow. And of course, she made the rounds on all of the shows over the years. Get Smart, The Wild Wild West, Bonanza, Daniel Boone, Hawaii Five O, Hogan's Heroes, Mod Squad, mm. The Odd Couple. Love American Style, oh. which is a, a show that another uh, actor in this episode was also on. Oh, wow. Uh, so she's in a little bit of everything. And naturally, she's dressed in this like deep V-neck purple dress. Barely with, covering her boobs. With the pointy Madonna bra. Mm -hmm. and Kirk introduces himself and she doesn't speak. She just <laughs> kind of stands there staring, smiling like an idiot. Yeah. Until a couple of red shirts rush in with heaters. She's standing up on the outer ring right. of the bridge, Away right? From so everyone. you have the lower deck where the captain's chair is and whatnot. And then there's that upper ring around. This is, I think, one of two shots that I read where we actually see that point of view, the view screen, somebody yeah. standing at the view screen. Yep. When the red shirts rush in with their guns, the mm -hmm. camera cuts to this view mm -hmm. from behind her, from, mm -hmm. from the view screen's point of view. And we see... Just how short, just how many that mini skirt really was. Oh, <laughs> Jean was a horn dog. You, I, if well, y'all didn't know Jean was a horn dog. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. You can you can see some cheeks. You can always see a little bit of cheek mm -hmm. underneath it. But then she's got these like deep purple thigh high fucking superhero boots. Like why bother? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like yeah, but it's it's. It's I, from the thigh to the cheeks. I don't think those boots got enough screen time, though. Yeah. Those are some hot boots. Oh. I, I digress. <laughs> do, you, uh, do you remember that episode where those aliens took human form and they had the plastic belt clips that turned people into D14s or whatever? Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, she's got that tech, but it's this wrist. It's a wristband gold thing. wrist armor looking thing, like Wonder Woman or She-Ra or some shit, you mm -hmm. know? <laughs> She, she presses a button on that and the lights flash off and on and everybody drops to the ground. We see this happen all over the ship, not just on the bridge. Even in sick bay. <laughs> like, I feel bad for Nurse Chapel because so in sick bay, they show McCoy and some unknown nurse and then Nurse Chapel carrying a tray. She drops the tray. And she fucking lands hard. Yeah, she does. I'm like, why does she <laughs> land so Majel. hard? I know Major yeah. had to land so hard. Everybody else just kind of slid to the ground, but she's uh -huh. like, bam. She hit the, <laughs> she, she hit the like, ground. She's like, I am all in. <laughs> <laughs> so everybody's been passing out. Meanwhile, on the bridge, the pretty alien lady is, so now that she's she decides she's going to walk around while everyone's passed out, like she's playing Duck, Duck, Goose or something. <laughs> And then she gets to Spock, who's slumped over, and she puts her hand on his head. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> <laughs> For all the weird shit this episode did with the remaster, mm -hmm. this return from theme is another. This time we get a, like a really funky camera angle around the Enterprise, mm -hmm. almost giving that like a drift in space feel. And I wondered if this was the original footage upscaled or if this was like something they, it felt like something they redid. So where do I go to watch the unremastered? I don't know. <laughs> I, th <laughs> I thought there was a way to change it on Paramount Plus I don't think... to watch one or the other. But uh, the last time I tried to, w to look for it, I couldn't find it. So I don't, yeah. I don't know. I'm curious. Anyway. The Enterprise comes back to life. All the crew starts waking up. The computers beep and boop. And uh, everything seems to be fine, except Spock's not on the bridge. <laughs> and then right then, he gets a call from McCoy from Thick Bay, and he's pretty frantic. And he's like, you better come down to Sick Bay. So Kirk and Scotty head down to Sick Bay to discover Spock 
laying on a bio bed on life support and McCoy and Chapel hovering over him. They dragged this whole scene and a couple others, maybe they dragged this out so much. Yep. I agree. Kirk demanding to know what's going on and McCoy seeming too afraid to speak about it or something. <laughs> He's it, like, like, spit it out, <sighs> spit it out, man. You know, <laughs> like, well, just say it. Yeah. Yeah. It was a lot. But then uh, this whole episode is a lot. So finally, McCoy's like, damn it, Jim. Didn't you see the title of the episode? <laughs> it's his brain. His, it's gone. <laughs> I mean, how is that? Of course, I started singing the Wizard of Oz. Yes. You know. If I only had a brain. But, like, how? Right. Like, this is right. Like, this is the dumb B movie. Like, now we have launched onto that track. Yeah, this is like the um, Killer Clowns from Out of yeah. Space or something. Yeah. Like, yeah. this was too far fetched to even make any sense. Something or someone has surgically removed Spock's brain, but with a level of medical sophistication like nothing McCoy has ever seen. <laughs> Although Spock himself might point out that that's not really saying a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but how could he survive? <laughs> <laughs> so bad. The, the acting so was, much overacting. Oh, the, the overacting was just too much. Yeah, it was cringe. It was very cringe. Every nerve ending in the brain was neatly sealed, nothing ripped, torn, or bleeding. And McCoy says that Spock's body somehow kept itself alive until the life support system took over. Again, big stretch. They keep giving this like, oh, his Vulcan physiology, blah, blah, blah. Like, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. You can only lean on that so many times, guys. They lean hard on it. Speaking of big stretches, McCoy says that he can't estimate how long he'll keep Spock's body going for because if it were a human... He'd be able to do it indefinitely. But a Vulcan body, it really needs that brain. <laughs> but oh. just two seconds ago, you told us that his body was so, his physiology was so much better than ours. Right. But then, and then he says in one breath, he didn't know how long he. Right. But then later he gives a time frame. Yeah. Just fucking call him Banga. Because yeah. Banga knows how <laughs> yes. to do, That's what I'm how saying. to deal with Vulcan physiology. Yes. You fucking ignorant. Doctor. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck McCoy. So Kirk decides to set off on Star Trek, the search for Spock's brain. You stuck this damn thing in my head, remember? Remember? And not just that, we're taking Spock along with us, weekend at Bernie style. Oh my God. <laughs> Mr. Lowman. Bernie. Hey, don't slap him. That's your boss. Uh -huh. I, you're right. Oh my God. Because, <laughs> because according to McCoy, if they do find it, they'll have to get it back into Spock's head super fast. Like I think you said, well, you've got 24 hours. Yeah. Now, how did he know that? It's like, because he just finished saying he didn't. Right. Anyway. Ugh. Well, that woman must have taken it. And he's going to find her. And McCoy's like, well, even if you do, I can't put the brain back. I don't have the medical ability. And Kirk's like, what about that Mbenga guy? Can, <laughs> can we get him up here? <laughs> just call yeah, just call him because you, you're you useless, McCoy. McCoy always presents these, like, we got to do something. <laughs> yeah. I don't know how to do that. And, uh, you know, I can't do it. Yeah. It drives me nuts. Kirk says, that woman, she took it out. She can put it back in. And he's like, she has the knowledge. I'll force it into her. Oh, my. I mean, wait, no. Wait, no. I'll force it out of her. I'll force it out of her. That's what That's I said. That's what I meant. That's, yeah. <laughs> McCoy sets the clock at 24 hours for some reason. And as Kirk leaves sick bay, he tells McCoy and Scotty to have Spock ready. What's Scotty got anything to do with this? He's in, in sick bay. Right. I, I don't know. I don't know what's... I don't know that Scotty said a word <laughs> <laughs> in there. I, I don't... Th I, he he went to sick bay with him, but I and don't why? Think, we don't know. Because he had to... Because he needs to be in used, the episode, I well, guess. Well, he used to... He's used to having a number one and... Spock's not there. <laughs> yeah. So I have so no Scotty's idea. Scotty's next. Yeah. No oh, idea. no, that's a good idea. I like that. I, that's, that's the only reason, but he didn't really say shit the whole time. <laughs> so, back on the bridge, I think this was where we get this really cool shot that we've never seen before. Because I was like, I always wonder what's over there in front of Chekhov, yeah. and, Chekhov and Sulu. Yeah. Like, is it a window? <laughs> like a <laughs> yeah. car window? Like a windshield? On the bridge, they're trying to follow that ion trail of that whatever they saw. And it's leading to System Sigma Draconis. And they've locked on at maximum speed. 
Now, I don't know if you noticed this or not, Mm -hmm. but another note about the remastering. They changed all this shit. Mm -hmm. And yet in this scene, Sulu jumps to maximum speed, warp six. Mm -hmm. And in the audio track, you hear like the turbine winding up, like the the kind of the engine rev, the the Uh it's getting faster and faster and faster as the pitch goes up. And on the view screen, the stars are just like chilling. Just like slowly hanging out. Did, like, they forgot. Uh, they that's forgot. one they could have fixed. Yeah. Easy. Yeah. And that had been one that that fixed a thing that Sarah wouldn't have noticed and gone, oh, God, that's something they fixed. Mm-hmm. Anyway. Some time passes and we get a captain's log. <laughs> 15 hours and 20 minutes they've been following this ion trail, which doesn't leave much time to find Spock's brain. And just then, Sulu loses the ion trail. Fuck. This episode loves to drag everything out. Yeah. I mean, everything. And it happens again here as they roll up to the Sigma Draconis system. And Chekhov puts up a star chart on the screen and then (laughs) walks up to it as if he's in like a corporate meeting or some shit giving a presentation (laughs) on the fourth quarter earnings. (laughs) Yep. Yep. And uh, they've got like, it's a PowerPoint basically of fucking star system. Yeah. Long story short, there's only three class M planets. And none of them are developmentally capable of launching interstellar s- spaceships. But Uhura gets some high energy readings from the sixth planet, which was last reported to have been in uh, some kind of ice age, mm-hmm. uh, heavily populated, but very, very primitive people. So surprisingly, Kirk goes around the horn asking for recommendations. <laughs> <laughs> a-, a departure from the Kirk that we've known for two seasons. So the issue is they don't have time to investigate every planet. Chekhov suggests the third rock from the sun. It's the closest. It's in the goalie lag zone. Yeah. And the most heavily populated. But Sulu reminds us that its industrial development is like Earth at the year 1485. And so Sulu suggests the fourth rock from the sun, which is an Earth equivalent of the year 2030. Still not advanced enough for ion propulsion, though. In the midst of all of this, Uhura muses out loud from her station, why would somebody want to take Spock's brain anyway? And I thought, it took 11 minutes and 38 seconds for somebody to ask that question. And she was the one who did it Mm -hmm. instead of McCoy or Kirk. Right. Our, their first reaction was like, well, we just got to find it. We got to get it back. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody ever once thought, well, why the hell would somebody want it in the first place? That's some Picard stuff. That's yeah. TNG. TNG is always like, okay, why did it happen? Not right. just barreling in and going after it. <laughs> Kirk doesn't take either of these suggestions, though. He settles on the sixth rock from the sun, the glacial planet. Uh, something about that regular strong energy pattern makes him think that there's more going on there than previous reports indicated and the act out here is kirk expressing the stakes of the mission if he's wrong about planet six then spock dies and sulu's like oh my (laughs) and Chekhov says don't worry mr sulu this happens again in the movies and spock turns out fine (laughs) make it quick admiral they are moving him to the federation funny farm yes poor friend I hear he's fruity as a nutcake. We just have to find his Katra. <laughs> <laughs> They've got eight hours and 29 minutes to find Spock's brain. And the, the captain's log, Kirk says, you know, we're going to beam down to this primitive glaciated planet. And they get to the planet. It's obviously it's cold, but I do appreciate that they did something here that we've always been wondering about, like when they... Beam down to a planet with a different temperature or whatever. Uh huh. They never say anything. They never wear anything specific. But this time, you can you notice that they have like an undershirt on. And Kirk actually said something about the suit temperatures. So they're, so they're being regulated. And that's like, yeah, it's like, hey, cool. They learned yeah. something. They all reach around their backs and like click, click, click the dial. Yep. Yeah. Why didn't we do this before? Yeah. Like, and since even like spacesuits, yeah. we see them do like, you know, yeah. they can regulate whatever, but. But, under, they ain't got no but underwear. <laughs> They're freezing. This is the underwear that has the the it's thermal. The thir- yeah, with, <laughs> but with the electric whatever the water that goes through the cool you and the electric thing that warms you up. There's a lot in the first thirty seconds of this episode. Yeah. The other thing that I I thought of was this is the the shot that I was talking about earlier mm-hmm. where 
you see this like you know wide angle sort of mountainscape yeah yeah very realistic looking shot that was completely new Mm -hmm. in the remastering Originally, it was another like paint the soundstage foam rock place, whatever. It, whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Well, what you actually see in the next, like it goes from that to there they on there are on the planet mm-hmm. in this snowy, rocky, whatever. That's all you saw the in the original mm-hmm. okay. release was that rocky cool. planet and Chekhov sitting around a heated rock. Like, <laughs> can you drop some coffee down <laughs> on a can on a string? <laughs> they love to heat some rocks, though. Yeah, they do. Our away team this week is Kirk, Scotty, Chekhov, and a couple of UC red shirts, and they beam into this rocky area. Kirk's mind is clearly elsewhere, as he sort of mindlessly says, life form readings, Mr. Spock. <laughs> I mean, Mr. Scott, sorry, I'm clearly, my, my boo's in trouble. I'm kind of <laughs> worried about him right now. My boo. Scotty says that there's some humanoids that are widely spaced, but they're scattered and they're on the large size. And Kirk's like, yeah, well, watch out because we know they're primitive. So we're we're talking like Neanderthal type people. Why is Scotty playing the role of science officer on this away mission? It looks like they really just did anything that Spock would have been doing. It's Scotty this episode. Yeah. Not someone who actually does that job. Right. Or uh, Spock's backup. But they just wanted Scotty to be in it? Yeah, where's Spock's understudy? I don't know. Good point, though. I didn't think about that. So we know that there's some large humanoids here, but, but primitive development, no structures or mechanized objects, nothing on the surface consuming or generating energy. Throughout this scene, we get some shots of some cavemen-looking characters, <laughs> uh, big, hairy dudes wearing animal skins. With some clubs and... They kind of need a shave and a bath. Shave and a haircut. Two bits. No? What? What the fuck? You, have, you don't know what that... You've, have you never heard that? No. It's the... Dun, 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 dun. That's where Is that, that where comes, that comes from. from? Yeah. I have no idea. Uh, shave and a haircut and the associated two bits... Had to be from like the 50s. Is a seven-note musical call-and-response couplet. Uh, riff or fanfare, popularly used at the end of a musical performance, usually for comedic effect. Uh, an early occurrence of the tune is from an 1899 Charles Hale song. 1899. At a dark town cakewalk. No. Nah. Other songs from the same period also use the tune. The same notes from the bridge in the hot scotch rag. Hmm. 1911. Sorry. <laughs> anyway, shave and haircut, two bits. Never knew that. Wow. Scotty's got five of these cavemen on the tricorder. <laughs> so phasers on stun and the away team moves toward them, taking up positions behind some icy rocks. <laughs> and these Neanderthal characters like jump from behind their icy <laughs> they're rocks. They're like, they're like, <laughs> and they just start fucking chucking clubs like and rocks, rocks and, and yeah. stuff at them. And, and they're just like, uh, the crew is just dodging it. <laughs> Kirk doesn't take much of that though before zapping one with his heater. Yep. And that scares the others away. <laughs> so they're like, we're, we're leaving you. Sorry, Boo. Sorry, dude. Uh, so they all leave their friend. And uh, Kirk goes over and he's like, you know, we're not your enemies. We're your friends. And we only wish to talk to you. I'm like, how did he, would he know that they can even speak? But right. sure enough, they speak English. Yeah. This conversation with this guy reminded me that this was the episode where they had like the... Men lived above ground and were like primitive and whatever, and the women lived below ground. I remembered that about like this episode. Yeah, I was gonna say that what, came oh, back to me in that <clears> moment. <throat> I didn't, I didn't remember this one at all. And I, this, I, I don't know if I'm confusing things or not, but we just talked about season three and the cloud minders being as like one group of people living above and one below, and how that plays. So mm-hmm. I don't know, like, if I was confusing all of them well, together that's an or not. interesting but... thought, though. Yeah. I hold that thought. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, Kirk's like, we come in peace or whatever. And, and the man <laughs> We come like... in peace or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and the man's like, wait, you are not the others. And we learn that the others are smaller, and they show up to give pain and delight. And Kirk's like, been nice knowing you, Spock, old buddy. This is my kind of place. <laughs> <laughs> Bring on the flogs and ball gags. Oh, my. 
and apparently they don't come from the sky because Kirk is like assuming that they're in a flying ship. But this Neanderthal guy says, no, they're here. You'll see the others are going to come for you. And of course, Kirk gets to the, the thing he's interested in the most. He's like, <laughs> do they come for your women as well? <laughs> and Moore's like, women, what is woman? <laughs> no, they don't know what woman is. They don't know what a female is. And Kirk tries to explain Oh, the female of your kind, you know, a, a mate, a companion. And he's they're like, huh? <laughs> no, <laughs> they still don't know. So Kirk's like, cool. Well, uh, I'm ready for some BDSM myself. Don't know about you, Scotty, but say, <laughs> uh, can you take us to these others? <laughs> <laughs> this sounds fun. <laughs> yeah. This provokes a strong fear response from the man. Chekhov returns, having found some kind of extremely old building foundations beneath the surface nearby. And again, the man freaks out at the away team talking about going in there. Like he pushes Kirk away and makes a run for it. <laughs> Fuck, I'm out of here. You guys going in that I mean, place. Uh -uh. Th that would tell me don't do it. But of course, that tells Kirk the opposite. If you <laughs> right? have someone telling him not to, it's like, OK, hey, let's go. <laughs> so this is quite the mystery. <laughs> Scotty calls from off camera, having found a cave full of food and whips and just like pallets of boxes full of butt plugs stacked up to the ceiling. Scotty thinks this is a storehouse for the cavemen, seeing how it's a cave and all. But Kirk notices some kind of electronic tripwire across the room. Nice. Like normally he would have tripped it, but he is able to avoid the tripwire and then they see like these weapons that are made of metal they're forged and tempered so it's obvious he, he says our apish friends didn't make these obviously so somebody's either setting a trap for them to get them to come in so they quickly decide this whole cave playset is a trap set by the others to capture the cavemen <laughs> and they're certainly not going to set that trap off so they go back outside and kirk pulls out his star tack and he calls up uhura to send down mccoy <laughs> my first thought was Oh, they're going to have McCoy set the trap. <laughs> <laughs> McCoy's supposed to beam down, and I'm assuming he's going to bring Spock. He doesn't say to bring Spock, but I think that's what they're waiting for. McCoy's whole purpose is to tend to Spock. And sure enough, McCoy and Spock beam down. <laughs> and <laughs> Spock is in brown coveralls, and he's got this like weird little helmet on. <laughs> and McCoy is holding can only be described as a remote. Yeah. It's like an RC car controller. Right. And obviously, you when you see Spock, he's not moving. He's basically brainless and a shell. And this remote that McCoy has is what is meant to control him. This is some high drama here. And McCoy clicks a button and RC Spock turns to look directly at Kirk with those hollow eyes. In the clicking. Yeah, and the clicking. <laughs> so they walk the RC Spock into the cave, and it's like click, 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 It was like... There was something about it that was creepy to me, and I don't know. Yeah, like it gives off a very robotic feel, but he wasn't a robot. Like, was what was making him move? If, it, if not this thing just telling... It, this like giving signals to the muscles to move in a certain way. There's no like I have no idea. click 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 click. What the fuck's clicking? I have no. <laughs> I have no answers. The signal? I don't know. Uh, it made no sense, and I hated it. Once everybody's inside the cage, Kirk trips to the beam, and a door slams shut behind them, and the room starts shaking. It's the cage again. <laughs> they're they're trapped in an elevator, cave elevator, and they're going down. Fast. Yeah. So fast that McCoy smarts off. Call Chekhov and tell him to send my stomach down. <laughs> <laughs> so Chekhov and the two UCs are outside the cave, and Chekhov says, you might as well get comfortable because it's going to be a, a long wait. And so then we see him use his phaser to heat the rock. Yeah. Which they've done it in two other episodes. Mm -hmm. And then they just sit there and warm their hands. As they descend further into the planet, Scotty's reading that power surge getting closer and it's massive. Either a nuclear pile, a hundred miles across, or ion power. So this is likely the place they've been looking for. And this is confirmed when the doors open into a hallway playset that we've no doubt seen before. Yeah. This looked super duper familiar. Yeah. 
And there stands another woman like the one on the bridge, but this one is wearing like a yellow gold mini dress, uh, gold boots, and she reaches for her Wonder Woman wrist zapper thing, and but Kirk stuns her first with the phaser. And then they rush out to see if she's okay. He, you just shot her, but Kirk wants McCoy to check her out and make sure that she's okay, and he gives her a shot of something to wake her up, and then she pulls her to her feet pretty roughly. Pretty roughly. Yeah, he takes her wristband off, like yanks her up and is holding her by the elbows, yeah. like really tightly holding her by the elbows. But then she's like, well, you don't belong here. <laughs> you are not Morgue. And this part here is very, well, obviously it's sexist. It's all sexist. Yeah. But this is particularly sexist because Kirk's like, who's in charge? I wish to speak to him. Yeah. And the girl's name is Luma. And she's like, what is him? So yeah. here we've got another person on the planet doesn't know about the opposite sex. Luma is played by Sheila Layton. She doesn't have a long list of credits, but she made appearances in The Man from Uncle, mm. The Green Hornet, Get Smart. I I love Get Smart. Everybody, I need to rewatch Get Smart. Everybody played in The Man from Uncle and Get Smart. Uh and, and Love American Style. And and which Love the other mm-hmm. actor was in as well. Uh Beverly Hillbillies, Hogan's Heroes, The Odd Couple. Kirk demands to know where Spock's brain is, but (laughs) Luma doesn't know. And again, she says, you are not Morg or I Morg. McCoy's scanning this entire time and says Luma's telling the truth. Because apparently (laughs) the tricorder has a lie detector built into it, which we've never seen before, but okay. Apparently, because he's like, (laughs) she doesn't know. He says, in fact, her brain is that of a child. So you can tell development of a brain? I'm like, apparently. Apparently that tricorder is only useful. On certain episodes. Scotty comes back, having picked up something on the StarTac. And as Kirk stops to check it out, Luma tries to make a run for it, but McCoy grabs her. What's that on the phone, Jim? It's Spock. Oh, yeah. So we hear Spock's voice say, fascinating. Activity without end, but with no volition. And Kirk's like, Spock, is that, is that you? And Spock's happy to hear Kirk's voice. And he actually <laughs> but, like says it. He says, but he doesn't understand why. Yeah. He's like, uh, there's a definite pleasurable experience connected with the hearing of your voice. And that's basically saying, hey, I'm happy to see you. <laughs> and McCoy pipes up and he's, he says, where are you, Spock? And he's like, is that McCoy? I hear I expected an insult. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, Spock's like, why'd you bring him? <laughs> <laughs> I, wa- I wanted an insult. I, I so wanted an insult. And Spock says, is that you, Dr. McCoy? Are you with the captain? And McCoy is such a dick. He's like, where else would I be? Right. And then Scotty pipes up. (laughs) Scott wants to know where he is. And Spock doesn't even know where he is. So it's up to the away team to find him. So they head off down the hallway, McCoy leading Luma by the arm and Scotty controlling RC Spock. (laughs) The woman in the purple mini dress comes around a corner with a couple of the cavemen from the overworld. and. Kirk starts demanding answers and reaches for his phaser, but he's not fast enough. (laughs) She presses her Wonder Woman armband and knocks them all unconscious. Except for Spock, because the robo Spock. Yeah, he just stays standing. I guess because he has no brain. Right. Is that why? I mean. It'd have to be. No pain center, I guess. No pain, no brain. (laughs) No No brain, brain, no no pain. pain. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> oh, that's got to be a that's got to be a T-shirt, Sarah, yes. or something. No brain, no pain. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> no brain, no pain. Oh my god! After the break, we're in an underground conference room. <laughs> as now, four of these women, all in a different color dress, are seemingly discussing things while a captain's log plays. <laughs> You may have noticed a couple of errors in these voiceovers, but, mm-hmm. but maybe not. In this one, Kirk says Sigma Draconis 7, not mm. 6. Oh. And we're actually on 6. This is Teddy Alpha 5! And in the, in the one prior, he got a little dyslexic with the star date. Mm-hmm. In three of the four logs, it's 5431. And in the one previous to this, he says 4351. Oh, let me see. So there's some inconsistencies in the star date and also what which planet from the sun this is. Wow. There's a bit of fun background acting here as we see Luma basically like reenacts the shooting of a heater and her passing out. <laughs> I thought that was really fun. Because apparently they're just so 
primitive and not very smart yeah. and that they can't get it out in words or so she has to like climb it <laughs> yeah it's so so silly oh and then so you notice too they have a new fashion uh, <laughs> accessory yes. on the crew uh, they have these belts around their waist now and with a big green round thing this looked to me very like star trek the motion picture mm. remember when they had all like the gray jumpsuits that had the little belt thing with the thing in front yeah that's what that reminded me of but it looks like, I don't know, like a it's plunger it looks like or something, something with a red dot in the middle. Yeah. Yeah, it's like a green plunger. <laughs> 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 There's a couple of caveman dudes standing behind them, and they also have these belts on. Mm-hmm. Kara presses, Kara or Kara? Is it Kara or Kara? Kara. I Ka- don't know. I, did they say her name a lot? I, uh, maybe once. I think she introduces herself or something. I don't know. Kara presses her She-Ra wristband and <laughs> Kirk, McCoy, and Scotty wake up and look around and she's like, what are you and why are you here? It becomes very clear that Kara doesn't seem to really know anything either, despite our all having seen her on the Enterprise. Stealing the brain, yeah. She doesn't know Spock or his brain or the Enterprise or anything. She's like, look, you're not Morg or I'm Morg. You're strangers. You hurt Luma. And I'm not going to let you do that again. But otherwise, you're welcome to leave. (laughs) Thanks for dropping by. I said good day. (laughs) (laughs) But Kirk's like, I saw your ass on my ship, you know. And um, But McCoy kind of says, jumps in. He's like, okay, maybe she doesn't remember. She's somehow disassociated. So it it doesn't even seem possible that she could have, like, taken his brain because she's not obviously capable of thinking. (laughs) And here it's revealed that we're dealing with another fucking computer controlling shit for a society. Yeah. They're asking about leaders and doctors and operators. And finally, they get down to the word controller. And she's like, oh, that's a word we know. Uh, Mm -hmm. But nobody is permitted to go near the controller. We serve the controller. And Kirk's like, Jesus Christ, Landrew? Is that you? Or is it Nomad? M5? Whoever you are. I'm going to talk you to death. Get out of here right now. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to talk your ass to death. So now Kara's got it in her head that they've come to destroy them. And McCoy's like, no, we just want to talk to somebody about Spock's brain. That's all. Surely you people must be tired of him by now. I know I would be. She's like, <laughs> brain and brain. What is brain? She was like getting so irritated with them. That is a classic line that I think a lot of maybe that's. In the category of if you you may not know Men, Star Trek, but meme. you may, yeah, brain and brain, what is brain? <laughs> <laughs> she says, it is controller, is it not? And that's exactly it. Spock's brain is the controller. Kirk tries another approach, and he gets down on his knees and, like, that throws his works. hands up. And, he, <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, I- I'm not used to doing this without the ball gag and the butt plug, but, fine, like... <laughs> He's like, so I've heard some things about you women. She doesn't buy his bullshit. He already said that they were there to take Spock's brain back. So she presses the button on her Wonder Woman armband and sends our heroes (laughs) into intense agony. Lots of Star Trek overacting. Yeah, he, uh, he said too much. These pain belts reminded me of, have you ever seen the videos where they hook men up to these machines that like simulate period pain oh, yeah, menstrual yeah, yeah, yeah. pain yeah the the little um patches yeah the electro magnetic pulse yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah 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 um i watched one of those where they hooked up this cop this like real kind of macho <laughs> tough i tough love dude watching kind of i love seeing them go to their yes. knees and i love it they cranked that fucker up to 10 and they were like so do you think you could go to work now and like work all day and yeah. be productive and yeah, shit and he was like to. fuck no i couldn't do that yeah yeah i like it So the woman plus a couple of cavemen guards leave to go figure out what to do now. Because they they portray them as like brainless, basically, and they can't do anything. Sulu records the ship's log, also fucking up the planet's number. Seven. This is City Alpha 5! Yeah, he says seven. I didn't even notice that. good Good catch. We see Chekhov and the boys warming their hands by the glowing rock again. And then back in the underground conference room, Kirk, McCoy, and Scotty regain consciousness. (laughs) Apparently they've never felt anything like that before. Mm -hmm. It's it's so painful. 
and Scotty's trying to get the belt off, but they're, there's some kind of magnetic lock, so they're not going to come off. And Kirk is like, well, no wonder the morgues are so obedient and terrified. So uh, I guess the pain is the belt and all that stuff. But then the pleasure is what? Looking at them? Looking at the girls? Yeah, because yeah. they're purdy. They're easy on the eyes. Purdy. In fact, they keep the morgue so obedient that there's a couple guarding them in this room. And one blocks a doorway when they try to walk towards it. And then they see their star tacks and heaters and tricorders on a nearby table. But a morgue blocks their way to those, too. <sighs> so they can't understand how these primitive people have been able to set up such advanced technology and keep it running. Because they all seem to, like you said, they all seem like they're brainless. Kirk really needs to get one of those star tacks, though. And he's got a plan to get around the morgues preventing this. Science. Well, the science he puts into effect is an old-fashioned... Star Trek fight! <laughs> Which is funny, because these dudes are fucking huge. Yeah. And, but it takes him a moment to get through all of them. He does some really cool moves here that, like, there was one where he, like, literally jumps up and... I don't know what you call that move when you kick someone in the chest, but you're, like, walking into their chest. Like, right. I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, there's some good moves. But they finally take them all down. McCoy administers something to the morgues to keep them sedated. And Scotty suits up with his away team gear while Kirk flips open the star tack and calls out to Spock again. Something interesting happens here. There's no response at first, but Kirk's kind of like pacing around the room like, hello, Spock. Are you there, Spock? Hello, we're calling you, Spock. And he walks past RC Spock. And then Spock's voice comes through the, the communicator. So there's something like uh, to proximity to if when he's near Spock's body, then Spock's brain can communicate to the communicator. You think that's really true? I, I think they thought that it was true. I think <laughs> I mean, they meant for it to be. I am wondering if they actually did that. Like it's so subtle. Mm -hmm. I didn't even pick up on that. <laughs> so interesting. So you got to be near Spock's body. So that's mm -hmm. <laughs> interesting. Yeah. Kirk's like, look, we might be able to locate you if we knew what they were using you for. Uh, something medical, maybe? And Spock's like, I'm not sure, but I do seem to have a body that stretches into infinity. <laughs> and the camera cuts to this large room-sized device thing. It's like a <laughs> large metal table with like three legs that extend up into the ceiling. And the middle is the black device with a glowing orb on top. Oh, another orb. And, Here we go, yeah. and Sargon's like, oh, you found me again. <laughs> Scotty didn't want to tell him, though. Scotty was like, you think you've got a body that stretches into infinity? Uh, you don't body. Why well, you have none? <laughs> they had to basically tell him, you know, you're a disembodied brain. Like, that would kind of hurt. <laughs> yeah. You're a brain in a vat. Yeah. Spock's like, why have you idiots endangered your lives by coming here? And Kirk's like, well, it won't be the last time, Spock. Needs of the one sometimes outweighs the needs of the many. Yeah. We, we spend a long friendship debating this fact. <laughs> <laughs> but he says, we came to put you back. We're putting you back in your body. Spock, even in disembodied brain form, gets a great bazinga in on McCoy. He's like, well, that's thoughtful. But you know McCoy's a fucking idiot, right? Like... He might be okay removing a splinter or lancing a boil, but brain work? Isn't Mimbenga still on the ship? Can we get Mimbenga down here to do this? Right. And there it is. There was the insult I was looking for yeah. earlier. I was like, thank you, Spock. Spock's still in there. And he says, like, no denigration intended, Dr. McCoy, but the skill doesn't actually exist in the galaxy yet. So, you know. Yeah, not just you. Yes. Nobody can do it. Yeah. Right. Five hours, 48 minutes left on the clock, <laughs> and Kirk has Spock send out a signal that they can lock onto to find him. So they leave the room, and out in the hallway, Kirk asks Spock about these pain belts, which Spock says can be released by the red button on the She-Ra bracelets. And Spock doesn't know what that means because <laughs> he hasn't seen any of this stuff. He's just a brain in a vat. But Kirk <laughs> understands exactly what it means. Further down the hallway, Scotty thinks they've found the door, and sure enough, Inside, there's the computer, but also Kara, mm -hmm. and she zaps them with her bracelet, and as they follow the ground, they realize now that R.C. Spock seems to be unaffected by this thing. Probably <laughs> something to do with not having a brain. Yeah. So, as they're all writhing on the floor, Kirk, 
he dropped the remote controls to Spock. So he tries to like overact to try to crawl <laughs> to it. I mean, it was so much. And um, somehow gets a hold of it and is able to turn Robo Spock around and get him to go towards Kara. And she's like, no. And then he basically takes her hand, figures out how to push one of the buttons on her wrist to make the belts drop. There's a ton of exposition in this scene. Apparently the old controller is finished, died maybe. And so Spock's brain will serve as the new controller, (laughs) giving these people life for 10,000 years to come. How they can keep a brain alive for 10,000 years is never explained. Yeah. Uh, As Kirk and Scotty walk around, we see more of the room. There's like wall-sized computers and panels all over. <laughs> there's, yeah. a, there's a hair dryer in the salon. <laughs> you've, you've seen those. Yes. That's exactly what I was thinking. It was- yes. We learned that what Spock assumed was his brain controlling breathing, pumping blood, and maintaining temperature is likely circulating air in this complex, <laughs> running heating plants, and purifying water. Kirk gets Kara's Wonder Woman bracelet off and demands that she restore Spock's brain, but she truly doesn't know how. McCoy even says, like, all of these people's mental abilities appear to be atrophied due to non-use. But Kirk was like, well, she was on the Enterprise. She was the one who fucking took it in the first place. How'd she do it? And she does finally divulge that it was the old knowledge, which they finally figure out to mean that it was knowledge that was put into her brain from the, someone called the teacher. He's walking her backwards toward the wall computer, the big computer on the wall. Mm -hmm. And she's talking about putting the teacher upon her head. And Kirk's like, I don't understand. Sit on your face? How does that get Spock back? (laughs) Oh, my God. Yeah, I mean, I guess you could see that. I put upon my head the teacher. The teacher is the great teacher of all the ancient knowledge. And now between them and in the background of the shot is that it's that helmet that Doc put on Marty when he showed up at his house in 1955. Don't say a word. Doc, I'm going to read your thoughts. Let's see now. You come here from a great distance? Yeah, exactly. Don't tell me. It's like a mobile (laughs) hairdryer. And then Spock, disembodied Spock, decides to explain to Captain that she's referring to, I guess, some kind of tape. A memory bank of knowledge that the builders of the place made, and it's apparently pretty impressive. Kirk demands Kara explain the device, but she refuses, says that only by the command of the ancients can she understand. The knowledge is forbidden, says <laughs> she will be punished, but Kirk forces her into the Doc Brown helmet anyway. I'm so dumb. I'm just a girl. <laughs> I, You know, ugh, uh-huh. this this whole thing. And I didn't, the only reason I didn't feel worse about that was that all the men were portrayed, like everybody on this planet was portrayed as stupid. Yeah. 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 That's the only thing that slightly made it fair. Right. But it was, it was still bad. Again, uh, you may have recognized components on this computer on the wall from the M5 Mm. and the computer on assignment earth. Uh, What was that one called? Doris? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, oh, beta five yeah that's beta five she, she she was totally <laughs> adora she was such a bitch anyway we get a big build-up of the computer connecting to kara and she opens her eyes as the helmet comes off and suddenly she is no longer this meek ignorant person mm. but she speaks with confidence yes interesting that they did that and i'm maybe wondering like was that intentional yeah know? was that intentional or was that one of their messages i don't know mm. She's like, the controller is correct about how the teacher works, but he didn't give me any credit. None of this could work without me. And even McCoy pays her a compliment for her delicate miracle of keeping Spock's brain alive. So it's not just the, the knowledge and the hat. It's, it's her, too. Of course. Even Kirk tries to kiss ass a little here. He's like, <laughs> yeah, you know, from the beginning, I appreciated your ability. I mean, everybody knew that. Everybody could see that, you know. <laughs> so obvious <laughs> and she's like cool 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 because without the teacher i wouldn't know how to use this and from her <laughs> mini skirt somehow she has hidden a phaser a phaser in that tiny little skirt so she pulls out kirk's heater and scotty that- scotty's like that phaser is set for kill <laughs> and she's not afraid to use it she's like this is the knowledge that you've brought me like killing you know yeah and if your weapon kills then it will kill you 
which is kind of, you know, they did it. They, it is their fault. I just realized how dirty that sounded. A lot dirtier than I intended it when I wrote it. But what? That she pulls Kirk's heater out from under her miniskirt. <laughs> <laughs> oh my. But it's, it's the truth. After the break, Kirk's like, we're surely not the first people in the galaxy to bring you the knowledge of killing. Besides, you're killing Spock right now. But she insists he will live for 10,000 years and they will worship him. But Kirk's like, no, 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 you're not hearing me. Uh, Spock will be dead. His body is dying right now. But Kara's like, Kirk, you of all people must understand the needs of the many. My people outweigh the needs of the few or the one. Your friend Spock. (laughs) (laughs) But he says nobody should kill anyone, not for any reason. And he tries just to just don't watch any previous episodes of Star Trek the original right. series. And just do as I say, <laughs> not as I do. Yeah. Um, and then he goes for the phaser. And she's she's like, Don't do this. I do not know of killing and I don't wish to kill, but <laughs> Scotty does some terrible acting here. <laughs> so he groans and he kind of like keels over a little bit just to try to distract her and which works. And then Kirk grabs the phaser from her. We learn here that this knowledge of the ancients lasts about three hours in your head, which should be just about enough time to put Humpty Dumpty back together again. (laughs) But she refuses repeatedly. So finally, McCoy's like, say, what if I put on that Doc Brown helmet? Think it'd work? And Spock's like, doctor, even with the knowledge of this ancient civilization, I still wouldn't trust your dumb ass to operate on my brain. He's like, this is made for alien brains. It could really fuck your brain up, McCoy. I mean, <laughs> I mean, if that's what you want. Yeah, you go know. for it. But, but hey, McCoy just wants to be smart for a little while. Yeah, you know. right. Spock makes one last argument against putting his life above everything else. But McCoy argues that, like, even if he retained just a little bit of that ancient knowledge, it could save countless lives. But he already sees that, like, Kara doesn't retain shit. Yeah. Like, she's doesn't even remember meeting them so i don't know why he thought he could retain something right so kirk tells mccoy to go ahead anyway kara makes one last effort to stop them but she's powerless now kirk puts the doc brown helmet on mccoy and he winces in pain as the knowledge is jammed into his brain (laughs) and he drops to his knees and he looks up and he goes of course of course a child could have done it so he's got the knowledge now so now we have to talk about the set in this scene. So now Spock is laying on a bed with the top of his head sticking. Like, imagine there's it's, a headboard on the bed. It's bad. And there's because... a hole cut in the headboard. And Spock's head is sticking through the top of the head. It's that's in the hole. Of, that's kind of how they do brain surgery, except they like certain kinds of neurosurgery where they do. It's more uh, like a curtain, though. Yeah. This it kind is, of thing, right? Yeah. This was like a. A whole, <laughs> a whole big old fucking piece of plywood it was with a hole terrible. in it. <laughs> it was terrible. And so McCoy's monkeying around with the top of his head and Spock's just laying there taking it. I feel like we've done this before. Kara's got the sads about losing their computer that runs the whole planet. Says that they'll die now, but Kirk's like, no, no, you'll figure it out. Like, you'll learn to live without it and we'll help you. And, mm-hmm. you know, y- you shouldn't have had all this done for you all this long anyway. Now the men in the above and the women below mm-hmm. will work together to control your lives or whatever. Like, you'll figure it out. And I feel like we've done this before. Yeah. And while I think he thinks he's being benevolent and everything, I think <sighs> this is a, it's a conundrum because he's modeling their society after what we know. Right. Well, like what, and what, what's to say Ooh. that that's. What's the best for them? Yeah. They could turn out to be fucking monsters. And yep. that's the reason that the controller controlled them. Yeah. It could, yeah. you know, he's again making decisions based on what we know to a yep. society to be. Yep. And I, yep. I, I, I think <laughs> I, like seasons ago, I would have been like, yeah, it's fine. But now I, I look at this a little differently. <laughs> yeah. Well, Kirk's explaining that they'll have to learn to build houses and grow their own food and <laughs> Cause, shit. Because that's what they're supposed to do? Because that's what he thinks they're supposed to do? It looks like McCoy's starting to lose the knowledge. 
millions of nerves and he's trying to thread a needle with a sledgehammer. So it's not looking very good for Spock. In this next sequence, uh, we have a captain's log voiceover while images cut back and forth between McCoy sweating like a hog. Yes. Why is he so sweaty? Because he's so nervous. Uh, uh, he's like, I'm going to fuck Spock up for good now. And I, I can't let that happen. And then you get a wide shot of the room. Mm -hmm. And then you get a shot of Kirk looking worried. You get a shot of Spock lying lifeless on the table. And then a shot of Kara. Reaction shots all around. Time to suspend all disbelief now because in the voiceover, we learned that McCoy's losing the knowledge, falling back on his own limited abilities. And so Kirk has instructed McCoy to give priority to reconnecting Spock's vocal cords so that Spock himself can help talk McCoy through the surgery or something. That makes sense. This McCoy's freaking out. He's like, I, he's dying. I can't stop it. But then Spock starts talking. So. I guess that McCoy started reconnecting the vocal cord. Yeah. Okay. So he's Spock again, says, as if that's a thing he knew how to do. Apparently, the so he, Spock says yes, Doctor McCoy, and he's really hoarse, and he asks Doctor McCoy to finish reconnecting the speech center, and then he might be able to help. So right. In Spock's limited mental capacity, <laughs> I guess he still knows how to do that. So. Once he does, he's <laughs> Spock goes ah um, and some weird, <laughs> and some other weird no noises, and he's like, "That's better," and he's back to his normal patronizing <laughs> yeah. um, self. And Spock tells McCoy, "Like, hey, get one of them sonic screwdriver things <laughs> and uh, poke the nerves one by one and see what happens." And basically, yeah, <laughs> I mean, he could have told them, but he could have figured that out. He he's poking around in the brain, and he zaps one of the nerve endings and. There's a huge bulge in Spock's pants. <laughs> <laughs> right forefinger, right wrist, right elbow. This is so stupid. But McCoy's pride is like taking a hit because he's like, Ugh, I can, uh, he'll never live it down because this Vulcan is telling him how to operate. Yep. So good. Yeah. Fucker. And again, where the fuck is Mbenga through all of this? I know. We really need him right now. Right? He's just down at the bar drinking with Scotty. I found this on uh, Ganner room. Uh, uh, Ganner mirror me. Time passes again, and McCoy's closed up the incision, still unsure if he's done it all correctly. Spock sits up and congratulates McCoy. <laughs> Kirk asks how he feels, and Spock launches into this, like, ADHD spectrum kid who's jazzed about a thing they just spent a bunch of time learning. Yeah. And he can't wait to tell you about. Just talking, 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 and McCoy has to get an insult in there. He's like, I knew it was wrong. I knew I shouldn't have done it. I knew I shouldn't have reconnected his mouth. <laughs> <laughs> and Spock's eyebrow shoots up, and Kirk's like, well, we, we did take the risk, Doctor. And Spock says, as I was saying, and he goes back into his diatribe about this new knowledge he's just learned. Laughs all around, and off we go, hopefully, to not nearly as stupid of an adventure next week. Boy, I'm sure glad that's over with. I'm happy the affair is over. Me too! A most annoying, emotional episode. Yeah, but you know, I learned something today. When dreams become more important than reality, you give up travel, building, creating. One jealous god, if all this makes a god. By sparing your helpless enemy, who surely would have destroyed you, you demonstrated the advanced trait of mercy. Frankly, I was rather dismayed by your use of the term half-breed. You must admit, it is an unsophisticated expression. Setting aside the brain gimmick, the dumb brain gimmick, I think the idea of spending time thinking about a civilization that was once, like, crazy advanced, but became reliant on that technology to survive, mm. or whatever... Like to an extreme where then they became so stupid and subservient and hello, uh, this sounds familiar. <laughs> I'm yeah, yeah. I worry about that with us. Like mm -hmm. when we were growing up, you know, you were you could remember a phone number, you could yeah. remember a sequence of ten digits. <laughs> yeah, I can't now. Now you don't no. have to, right? Because it's in your phone. Yeah, and that's when with kids who are growing up in this age who never had to remember shit, yep. didn't have to look in a phone book or didn't know how to look at a map or didn't have to look at a map. They've got Google or Alexa or somebody telling them where to go. Right. 
I worry about us not, what am I trying to say here? They're missing the ability to think for themselves because it's being done for them. Right. And if you grow up that way, then I feel like you're going to miss out on certain skills. Your brain's not going to get used. Mm -hmm. And I think this is what's going to happen is they're not going to know what the fuck they're, who's going to be our doctors? Who's going to be, you know, who's going to do the important things? Who's going to be our engineers? We're right. going to go to, what's that movie? Um, Wally. No. Um, Idiocracy. Ah, yes. That's what's going to happen. Yeah. I feel. There is the needs of the many theme mm-hmm. that comes, you know, mm-hmm. around Star Trek from time to time. Is it better to, you know, do what's in the best interest of this people on this planet or Spock in this case? <laughs> like who has the priority here? And. You know, like I think we've talked about in terms of like how the government can't force you to do it. Mm -hmm. Right. So in this case, like you can't force Spock to do it. But if Spock willingly does it, that's different. Yeah. Right. He would have willingly done it. He, I think he would have. We don't explore that theme really at all. Yeah. Yeah. This was just something forced upon him. It was forced upon him. But like his mind, he would look at it from a logical perspective and he would be like okay this is kind of cool um you know what i mean and he'd be curious about it and because the whole time he was a disembodied brain he would be like fascinating you know what i mean yeah and he was enjoying the experience yeah yeah and said several times why are you here putting all of your lives on the line for me yeah yeah so in this instance though it was the needs of kirk it wasn't the needs of spock necessarily it was the needs of kirk he needed his friend versus yeah. His friend. Wink. <laughs> Spork. <laughs> I don't know. That's a good one. And then there's the one where, again, we're going in and thinking we're doing a good thing for another civilization or, and maybe we're not because there's some, uh, there's other sides to consider. Yeah. Who are we to say that your civilization should look anything like ours? I thought we were out here to, you know, seek out new life and new civilizations and not expect them to be just like us. Nah. Like, that's kind of the point. We're really, they're really just colonizing, honestly. Yeah, they're they like, are. you need to be like us. Yeah. What, the men and women live separately? That can't happen. We right. can't allow that. Sure you could. Yeah. What's the problem? <laughs> Did anybody die in this episode? No. Man, you've got like... I. Two or three weeks off. <laughs> I've got I've got some rhymes like boiling up. I'm ready yeah. to I'm ready for someone to die. So. <laughs> What's the next episode? The Enterprise incident. There's Romulans involved. Oh, well, somebody's gonna die. Somebody's gonna die. Somebody's gonna die. Let's get right to business. Fine, I'm authorized to pay an equitable price. Federation has invested a great deal of money in our training. They're about due for a small return. Listen, we pay off percentages. We're entitled to a little service for our money, huh? Is this the way your citizens do business? They write a petition. They pay their percentages and the boss takes care of them. (laughs) Is there anything else? There are a lot of great ways to help support the show here. One of the free ways to do that is to leave a rating and review wherever you listen to Humanist Trek. Tell some friends. uh, Pyramid scheme this shit. If you tell three friends (laughs) and they tell three friends. One of the best ways to support us, though, is to give us some of your gold press latinum by becoming a patron of the show. We want to thank all of our patrons. We especially want to thank our founding admirals. A special thank you to Russell, Ali, Peter, Sarah, and Sherry. Thank you, guys. Thanks, patrons. Patrons get early access to every episode, special merch. There is a quickly growing catalog of bonus content like personal logs and reactions to uh, very short treks. And we've got some, uh, there's a South Park episode we did, and I'm Mm -hmm. looking for I'm looking for the next one now Mm -hmm. to do. Uh, The South Park episode? Is there another one? No, but I don't know what it'll be. Mm. Some Star Trek spoof of something. Okay. Some spoof of Star Trek. Uh, Anyway. So there's lots of great reasons to to join our fleet. Head on over to patreon.com slash humanist trek and pledge as little as $3 a month. It really does make a big, big difference. And it means a lot to us. I assume you're loitering around here to learn what efficiency rating I plan to give you cadets. Trainees, to the briefing room. Is that all you gotta say? What about my performance? Aren't you dead? I don't believe this was a fair test of my command abilities. There was no way to win. There's no correct resolution. It's a test of character. Now, what is that supposed to mean? I am understandably curious. May I ask you a question? Who's been holding up the damn elevator? 
And now let's bring Becca back in for the exciting conclusion to last week's Starfleet Academy Cadet Challenge. Last week on Humanist Trek, you asked us. In his book, William Shatner referred to this episode as one of the worst. How did Leonard Nimoy feel about this episode? That it was the absolute worst. That was my answer. And I sort of agreed with you, but then I said, but then I asked, well, maybe he felt the opposite way. Right. So, I don't know. Leonard Nimoy stated that he felt embarrassed during the entire <laughs> shooting of this episode. Incorrect. Uh, I can see that. Uh-huh. I can totally see that. Yeah, because so. he was just fucking sitting there like a... Ru- and the and robot... The, thing- and the clicking. The clicking. Oh, my yes. God. The fucking clicking. <laughs> Jesus Christ. All right. Well... Next week, do we count that? Did we get points for that? What are you giving us? Sarah gets a point. I really, I don't, I don't know because he didn't, he didn't say it, what the it, question. He didn't say it was the, the question worst episode. was, and this is this is wordplay. Oh, here we go. The question was, how did Leonard Nimoy feel about the episode? We you wouldn't know that, we but wouldn't know. so you said he he thought it was the worst episode, but like the thing was, he, he felt it. embarrassed. He felt embarrassed. All right, fine. I didn't get so a point you, either. No, sorry. Screw you. <laughs> We couldn't have guessed that. <laughs> that was the point. <laughs> that was ungettable. That was an ungettable. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Next week, we'll be reviewing Star Trek, the original series, season three, episode two, The Enterprise Incident. Disguised as a Romulan, Kirk steals a cloaking device. Now, the, oh, I, I very vaguely remember Kirk like cosplaying as a Romulan. Very vaguely. Me too. I vaguely remember him having the... The eyebrows. the eyebrows yeah that's yeah, it. yeah that's yeah. all i i don't remember anything else nope about this okay what's our question for the enterprise incident this was the last live action appearance of the romulans in the star trek franchise for quite a while how many years passed between this appearance and the next what and i will give you a bonus <sighs> point if you can tell me the name of the star trek tng episode that the romulans reappear in oh fuck well i'd Definitely, it's, well, mm. it's, it's got to be. That's twenty. All right. Uh, yeah, let's do the math. Cause twenty. Uh, do you think it was in season one of of uh, yeah. TNG? So can I look at the 60, episode titles? 60, no, that's fuck. Are you kidding me? <laughs> Sixty-eight. Uh, Eighty. Was it eighty-six? Was it eighty-seven? Eighty-seven. So I it was think. nineteen years. Let's say twenty exactly. I'm gonna say nineteen years. I'll say exactly. Oh 20 my god! Years. What was the name of the Romulan that he was like? He was a, a running character on TNG. I don't know his name. Oh. I, if I heard it, I would remember. The only like alien name that's coming to my mind is General Martok. I can't think no, of that's... the Romulans' names. Fuck. Shit. All right. Well, I, wanna, I still want to Google this right now. So, I know. Me too. <laughs> so Ali says twenty. You say nineteen. Yeah. And nobody knows the name of the episode. Right. All right. Okay, well, we've locked in our answers. If you want to play along, no cheating, no Googling. Set a course for your nearest social media. Post your answer, use the hashtag Starfleet Challenge, share out this episode, and we'll pick out our favorite to be the winner. Next time on Humanist Trek, Star Trek, the original series, season three, episode two, The Enterprise Incident. Live long and prosper. Kapla! Humanist Trek is available wherever you replicate your podcast. Follow us on all the social medias at Humanist Trek. Become a patron at patreon.com slash humanist trek. Open hailing frequencies to podcast at humanist trek.com and visit our website, humanist trek.com. Humanist Trek is a production of Sarah Austin Media.